Well, the verses that we're about to study in Ephesians 4, for me to try to describe the impact that they've had on me would be um, uh, almost impossible. Uh, these verses at the end of Ephesians 4, starting the verses with verse 17, have had an incalculable just effect on my own walk with the Lord. From very early years in the biblical counseling movement, uh, Jay Adams taught four communication principles from the end of Ephesians 4, and uh, they have been used of the Lord to just impact uh, thousands of lives. But what we're going to do before we get to those four communication principles is talk about, in general, how people grow and change, because you need to understand the context before we actually get to the four communication principles. It's really interesting in Ephesians 4 that most of the principles that Paul uses to describe what is called the put off, be renewed, and put on process have to do with relationships with others. And that tells me that Paul was a very realistic uh, person and understood the dynamics going on in the church at Ephesus. And if you, I want to start off by work, I'm going to try to work hard describing the context to the book of Ephesians. But think about what was going on in Ephesians. We had Jews and Gentiles becoming a new thing called the church, Ephesians 2. People from radically different cultural backgrounds are being blended into this new thing called the church. And so then in Ephesians 4, he's teaching, okay, how do you put off the old man? How are you renewed in the spirit of your mind? And how do you put on the new man? And then we'll uh, transition into, based upon this put off, be renewed, put on principle, how does that then apply to the area of communication and for communication principles from the end of Ephesians 4. But just to get our minds going here, and I'd like you to look at Ephesians 4, and I'm going to read verse 28 that doesn't have to do with communication, but I'm going to read it just as a paradigm for what's going on in the passage, and it'll make these questions make a lot more sense, why I'm asking them. Years and years ago, Jay Adams asked the question, when is a thief no longer a thief? Now, that's an important question for our culture, right? Uh, with uh, recidivism as high as it is in our culture, you know, people spending time in jail, they come out, and you can almost, uh, vast majority of the time, they end up going back in jail. When is a thief no longer a thief? Listen to verse 28. And this is the power of the gospel to change lives. And this is a, a, about the only verse at the end of the passage that doesn't have to do with communication or relationships with other people. So when is a thief no longer a thief? Verse 28, let him who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. So the answer to the question, when is a thief no longer a thief, is not when we lock him up in jail. The answer is, when he stops stealing, he learns to work hard, and he's giving to other people. Then you know this is a transformed person, right? Well, the same thing, a principle applies to these questions. When is a gossiper no longer a gossiper? Well, it's not just stopping gossiping. Or when is a slanderer no longer a slanderer? Well, it's not just, well, I don't talk anymore. You know, I have such a problem with gossip, I just stop talking. Well, maybe that's one of the important steps you need to learn, but it's not the whole transformation of the inner person. Paul's about to describe for us how people grow and change as believers. You put off the old man, you're renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new man. All three of those points are equally important, putting off, being renewed, and putting on. Or when is a yeller no longer a yeller? When he's old yeller, right? <laughs> um, sorry, some of you don't even know that movie or book. <clears throat> It's not just why well, stop yelling. We need an inner transformation of the person. Or maybe uh, you're like me. I tend to be a clamor upper. <laughs> uh, when is a clamor upper no longer a clamor, clamor upper? <laughs> it's not just, well, I'm quiet. Uh, 
I have to learn how to have the right motives for talking, why I should talk. I need a transformation of my attitudes in my heart as we talked about last night. So let's start off with the put off, be renewed, and put on process. And I'm gonna go through that rather quickly. And I'm, I'll warn you now, <clears throat> by the end of this presentation, you're gonna have hand cramps because there's all kinds of extra slides that are not accounted for in the notes. So uh, try to write fast and remember again, do not be discouraged, the presentation is online. So you can go back and get all the PowerPoint slides if you wanna go back and fill in your notes. I came across years ago uh, from one of our colleagues, Dr. Stuart Scott, a wonderful definition of communication. This is uh, not in your notes. Wonderful definition of communication, learning to communicate in a godly way. One of the underlying themes of this presentation is going to be this, that the gospel ought to impact the way we talk with others. And think about what we believe in the gospel to kind of pave the way for where we're gonna be in a few minutes. Think about what we believe in the gospel. We believe, if I ask for feedback from you, what, is, what words come to mind when you think of the gospel, things would come back like love, grace, mercy, forgiveness. So if the gospel or has, been, has been talked about in recent years, if we're living a gospel-saturated life, what should be coming out of my mouth? Grace, mercy, forgiveness, etc. That's all part of the flow, the atmosphere of Ephesians 4, because the theme of Ephesians 4, uh, fitting in with the whole book, or the theme of Ephesians is Christ, who died for us, is the head of his body, the church. Now chapters 4 to 6, live like Christ is your head. He starts off the transition in Ephesians 4 with this verse, I beg you, therefore, I beseech you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. Well, that's chapters 1 to 3, all about Christ who died for his church and is now the head of his church. Now chapters 4 to 6, how do you live as if Christ is your head? And then chapter 4, put off the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, put on the new man. Those of you who are stealing... Don't steal because that doesn't line up with like Christ is your head, but learn to work hard and give to others. Those of you who aren't speaking truth, learn to speak truth with your neighbor. It all fits in with the whole theme of the book of Ephesians. The gospel ought to impact our communication. So Stuart Scott defined it this way. Good communication from God's perspective is sending a message that is holy, purposeful, clear, and timely. That's worth memorizing. Holy, purposeful, clear, and timely. So if you know you struggle or wherever you struggle in communication, you get this just ingrained into your mind and you ask yourself, is what I'm about to say to my spouse holy? <laughs> is it purposeful? Is it clear? That's where I struggle quite a bit because I can be in such a rush and I just kind of assume Rose can read the rest. She can fill in the blanks with what I'm not saying. Is it clear, or I leave the house in the morning and I say, kids, I'd like you to do this, 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 and this, and I get home and this and this were done, but not this, 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 and this. Well, Dad, I didn't uh, understand that you meant today. Well, I just kind of assumed you were gonna understand that it was today that I wanted you to do that. Is it clear what I'm saying? Holy, purposeful, clear, and is this the right time? Just because I've got something on my heart to say, does that mean that Rose is ready to hear it? Uh, I need to pray for her and help her or pray for the timing of saying what I need to say. Holy, purposeful, clear, and timely. So let's dig in to, with Ephesians 4 and think through this put off, put on, be renewed in the spirit of your mind process, and then four principles for how it applies to communication. Uh, really quickly here with this first one, because we don't have a lot of time to uh, dig into all the details, but Paul says this in verse 20. Verses 17 to 19, he's talked about Gentiles, meaning unbelievers, 
and how they walk in the futility of their mind. Now you say you're a follower of Christ, you ought to be responding to life in a different way. Verse 17, or I mean verse 20. You did not learn Christ in this way. Uh, one comment that I would make here is about the word learn. You notice that I have it uh, highlighted up there. The word learn is related to our word for disciple. This is a manthano, a learner. I think Paul has in mind, you've become followers of Christ. Now this impacts the way you deal in relationships with others. Don't respond like you used to respond. You've learned new things about Christ. You say you're a follower of Christ, or as he said in chapter 4, verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Live up to your calling. Live up to who you say you are. You're a Christian. Christian means Christ's one. I say that I'm following my Lord now. Now I want my life to match what I say my identity, my new identity is. You did not learn Christ in this way. Uh, some principles related to communication. I should be learning to communicate in a way that's radically different than the world. Just because the world says, and some people have the attitude, you have no right to speak to me that way, and I'm going to speak my mind no matter what you think. Well, is that a Christian attitude? Is that a gospel-saturated attitude? Does that show that Christ is my master? Uh, Christians ought to be communicating and dealing with conflict in a way that's radically different than the world because our goal is Christ-like communication. I want to live as if Christ is the head of his body, the church, and I, I say I'm identifying with him. So, foundational for change is God's word. Uh, learning about Christ, and that's just basic to all change. Uh, John 17, 17, the Lord said, Sanctify them through your truth, Father, for your word is truth. Foundational to all change is knowing, learning about Christ. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Uh, real quickly here. I need to put energy into living out what I say I have. I want to live a gospel-saturated life. So that means mercy, forgiveness, grace, reconciliation, redemption. It makes, when I understand life this way, it makes total sense to me why Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Everything is about Christ. Rather than I'm obsessed with this, and I'm obsessed with this, and I'm a passionate about this, and I'm also passionate about Christ, it's no, I'm obsessed with Christ, and everything else is subsidiary to my relationship with Christ. For me to live is Christ. That overlaps a bit with what we were talking about last night in the heart. Paul says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that definitely includes my communication. How do I talk to others in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ? It overlaps with what Wayne was talking about uh, the last time of as the gospel impacts me and forgiveness and uh, how much I've been forgiven. And I really appreciated his practical homework ideas of dwelling on thinking about your great sin and who am I to hold this against this person? Who in the world am I to hold this sin against this person when I think about what I've done to the God of the universe in relationship uh, to the God of the universe. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that leads us then to verse 22. And I would urge you to go back through this and think through the whole flow of thought because what Paul is doing is he's teaching the principle, put off, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, then put on. And then Paul's a good teacher because then he gives illustrations. What does it mean to put off, be renewed, and put on? And then the rest of the chapters is, is all illustrations and applications of how to put off, be renewed, and put on. So he says this in verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. There's going to be some interesting theology we got to deal with here. You lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. I'm wording this uh, very precisely, trying to capture what I think the flow of thought is here. Uh, we used to say in the biblical counseling movement, put off the old man as if it's just this decision you make. 
Well, Paul is literally saying, you have put off the old man. That's what chapters 1 to 3 is about. Uh, to be technical with the grammar with you, Ephesians 1 to 3 is what we call the indicative. And then chapters 4 to 6 is the imperative. The indicative is, this is who you already are in Christ. It has already happened. That's Romans 6. Romans 6 has happened. You are in Christ. One of Paul's favorite phrases, literally, one of the phrases that Paul uses more than anything else in his writing is the idea of being in Christ, with Christ, in whom, with whom, over a hundred times in Paul's writing. I think it's 15 times at the, from the end of Colossians 1 through Colossians 2, Paul talks about you are in him, with him, in whom, and it's all about who you already are in Christ. So what's he saying here in verse 21 or 22? In reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. It's like it happened, but he's also saying live up to what already happened. So that's why my wording is this way. Take decisive action and live up to who you already are in Christ. A parallel passage with this is Colossians 3.5. And Colossians 3.5 makes it more a command and says put to death the deeds of the flesh. Colossians and Ephesians are books that parallel each other, and Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 are parallel passages. So in Colossians 3, Paul makes it more of a command, and he says, kill sin. Put to death sin, or as the Puritans called it, mortify sin. Uh, John Owen in his famous book said, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Put to death sin. So putting both of those ideas together between Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, the flow of thought that I get is my wording there. Take decisive action, and you could change it to, to live up to who you already are in Christ. Ephesians 1 to 3 and Ephesians 4 to 6. Who are we in Christ? We are in Christ. Uh, chapter 2 Verses 5 through 10 tells us who we already are in Christ. Colossians chapter 2 tells us who we already are in Christ. Uh, it's amazing to think about this. Let me encourage you. I hope this encourages you. When Christ died on the cross and he said that it is finished, part of the theology behind that is this very encouraging doctrine that everything that was necessary for your growth and godliness was already accomplished on the cross. That deserves an amen. <laughs> everything. Absolutely. You get discouraged and you go, I will never change. I can't change. It's impossible. Everything that was already necessary, everything necessary for your growth and godliness was already accomplished on the cross now, whether you feel like it or not, Scripture says, Romans 6, Colossians 2, Ephesians 4, you are in Christ, and that's your new identity. Whether our reality, and we feel it or not, that is not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about your new position in relationship to God. I find that really encouraging. So live up to who you already are. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get rid of the old man. I want to get rid of the old man. <laughs> Do you want to get rid of the old man? I'd love to get rid of the old man. <laughs> Lay aside the old self. Heaven's looking more beautiful all the time. Uh, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. This ought to encourage our counselees. Our Lord is in the business of change. Our Lord is in the business of change. I skipped over some things in the notes, obviously. B, C, and D. Uh, I didn't go into all the details there. And now I'm into point two, making a decision to put off the old man. Take decisive action. What are we wanting to get rid of? We're wanting to get rid of the old man because the Lord is in the business of change. Why should I want to get rid of the old man? Because my flesh lies to me. Uh, the flesh makes big, big promises he says here, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Uh, we're going to talk about that with the last session when we talk about sexuality and just all the lies 
that the world, our culture, the Los Angeles area tells about sexuality, the lusts of deceit. We already read Isaiah 61, so I won't do that again, but um, I found this years ago from reading Francis Schaeffer, and I forget which one of his books it was in, but he was talking about the idea that the world lies and the philosophies of the world lie. Uh, this rewrite of Psalm 23 was found on the body of a heroin addict. King heroin is my shepherd. I shall always lack. He makes me to lie down in the gutter. He leads me beside turbulent waters. He destroys my soul. He guides me in the paths of unrighteousness for his namesake. Part of change is telling myself the truth. This thing that I'm desiring lies to me. My inner person does not tell me the truth. The whole idea of being true to your heart and let your heart be your guide is some of the stupid advice that our culture gives. Let your heart be your guide. The more you understand what the heart means biblically, you go, wow, that is just really foolish advice. And remember what we talked about last night related to the heart. So why should I rid myself? Because... My flesh is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Uh, if I, let's make our applications communication oriented. If I speak my mind, that is what's best for me because it's not good for me to keep all this pen up on the inside. So I just have to speak my mind. Well, guess what the other person does back? You're going to talk to me that way? I will talk to you the same way right back. That's the lusts of deceit. There's a reason why Proverbs 15.1 says a soft answer turns away wrath. Learning how to control our tongue and learning to see a situation diffused rather than I just got to ventilate, I got to get it out because that's what's best for me. Paul says that the change takes place as we renew, we're renewed in the spirit of our minds. Now we've got to be careful about this one, this renewal in the spirit of our minds. We need to talk about what the mind is. The way I used to understand this, and I wish it worked this easily, was if I memorize enough Bible verses, I'll put off the old man, memorize the Bible, and put on the new man, and I'll be a changed person. Some of the most difficult people I've dealt with are people that knew a lot about the Bible and had a lot of Bible verses memorized. When Paul says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, he's not saying, think Bible and you'll change. Now, it's absolutely crucial to memorize the Bible, meditate on the Bible, but you have to have the right motivation behind it. Let's think about what does he mean by mind. Mind in the Bible is really equivalent, very close to the idea of the heart as we were talking about last night. Be renewed in the inner, not spirit, capital S. He's talking about your spirit, your inner person. Be renewed in the inner person of your mind. Mind is this, your reasoning, but not just cognitive brain waves like I memorize the Bible and it changes me. But your reasoning, your attitudes, and your intentions. That takes us right back into Hebrews 4 last night, the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God is not just interested in superficial change. When is a thief no longer a thief? It's when his attitude changes. Wow, I've been a selfish person. I steal from people. I'm lazy. I take from people because I don't want to work for a living. Christ changes the motivations of the inner person so that I need to stop stealing, I need to go get a job, I need to learn to work hard, and I need to learn how to give to other people. Wouldn't you know that the Gospels transform the person? Because they're being changed from the inside out, not just superficial behaviorism, but the attitudes of the inner person are changing. The motives of the heart, what the person is living for is changing. This all applies to our communication too. It's not just I'm going to learn some communication techniques and I want to teach my counselees communication techniques. As a biblical counselor, I want to teach them why we communicate the way we do. I want to communicate with the right motives. This is not 
how to win friends and influence people. And I'm going to learn some nice, neat ways to make people think that I love them. <laughs> but I really don't. I'm just trying to be a nice person when I'm around people. You know, I'm going to be a nice politician and I'm going to shake hands and I'm going to kiss babies. Not because I really care about babies and I really care about these people. I want their votes. Uh, scripture has a lot to do with the motivation of the heart. We communicate from a heart that has been impacted by the gospel. Be renewed in the spirit of our minds. So it's not just repeating, reading, memorizing the Bible. That is all really important. But it's not going to work if you're not doing it from the right motivation. I must choose to believe what I am reading and repeating and memorizing and meditating on. I act on it because I love the Lord, not because it's just the good Christian thing to do and I'm supposed to practice good communication with others, but I want to practice communication because of what the gospel has done in my life. Uh, that's what the book of Ephesians uh, is about. Now, that takes us back, and this is the part where I am going to go through, and don't even try to take notes right now. That would be... Uh, You'll just get frustrated. So let me just remind you a little bit about what the heart is biblically and go back through this from last night. We're addressing things, why do we do what we do? In other words, why do I talk to people the way I talk to people? This is all about communication. Remember Matthew chapter 12. The Lord says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That too has to do with my heart. I talk to people or... Maybe I don't talk to people. Maybe you're the clamor-upper. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth doesn't speak. Both things originate in the heart. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart, for from it flow the issues of life. So whether you're the really verbal person and you take control of situations, or you're more the flight person and you run away from situations, both are originating in the heart, according to Scripture. Why do I respond to life the way I do? And then we looked at a whole bunch of definitions of heart. What is the heart biblically? It's the seed of my wants and my desires, appetites, passions. I didn't say this last night for the sake of time, but just think about this in communication the next time. And it may have come up the last time, last month. What am I wanting that I'm not getting? What am I getting that I'm not wanting? If the heart is about desires, that's really kind of a shorthand way to get down to the really bottom level of why do I communicate to people the way I do? If it's about desires, if it's about wants, it's about the intentions of my inner person, what am I wanting that I'm not getting? What am I getting that I'm not wanting? I talk out of my inner person. Look back at Ephesians chapter 4. And I promise you we're going to get back to the outline. This is all stuff that's kind of embedded in the outline. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Right at the hinge point of the book, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, so based upon everything I've written in chapters 1 to 3, I'm now telling you how to live I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Now look at these character traits. With all humility, gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. At the top of Paul's list of how the gospel impacts our lives are these character traits. Gentleness, patience, forbearance, and being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace or commitment. Look at my chart just for a moment. Theologically, biblically, everything originates in the inner person, the heart. And then I'd put the character traits at the next level out. And we're, we're aiming towards strong relationships. We all want strong relationships. Well, as the Lord changes my inner person... Then I learn to be a more humble person, gentle person, patient person, showing forbearance to others, and being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I'll give you an illustration of this in just a moment of why it's important to address the inner person. And then relationship skills happen, strong relationship skills, like learning how to communicate, learning how to resolve conflict, 
learning how to serve other people, learning how to spend time with other people. There are skills that we all need to learn that just strengthen relationships. So both character traits and skills, they really originate in the heart. Now, one thing that I would caution you of here is the idea, and I believe we talked about this last month a little bit, the idea in our culture that you have a fixed personality. And you read these verses and you go, it's very easy to get yourself off the hook and say, well, that's just not me. I'm a type A. I just give commands to people, and that's just the way I am. I'm just not a gentle person, and people need to accept me the way I am. Well, if you believe in fixed personality, you're short-cutting, short-circuiting progressive sanctification. You're saying, I can't grow and change in Christ-likeness. Now, obviously, we all have different personalities. The world would be a pretty boring place if we all had the same personality. But the problem is the idea of it's fixed, and you can't change. We can learn to be gentle and humble and patient as the Lord changes the inner person. And I'm slowing down a little bit because this will apply directly to those four communication principles that we get at the end of Ephesians 4. Let me give you an example. How do controlling people talk to others? Let's uh, think about character traits and then relationship skills. Let's say the inner person problem, and one of the ones on my list that I suggested to you last evening is a person who just desires to control life. The heart is about desires. What am I wanting? I live to keep my life under control. That's what I'm living for. This, the answer biblically for that person is they've got to become an expert in the sovereignty of God. There is a God who is in absolute control of this planet, and it's not about me frantically trying to control my own world, whether it's big picture or small picture of the daily life. It's about learning to live trusting my heavenly Father every day. I don't have to frantically be controlling my, my world. Well, how does a controlling person, both in character traits and relationship skills, relate or talk? Uh, character traits. They would be the opposite of humble, right? Verse 2. They would be the opposite of gentle. They'd be harsh. They'd be the opposite of patient. They would be irritable. Rather than putting up with relationships, forbearance, they'd be intolerant in relationships. And they would not be committed. Instead of being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, they would say, well, that's the way you're going to be. I don't have time for you. But where's it originating? It's originating in the controlling nature of the inner person. So what needs to happen? We would say it, just putting it bluntly, that heart idolatry needs to die. The desires for control over life need to die, and they learn, need to learn to be an expert in the sovereignty of God and that learning how to rest in God. Well, as soon as you start doing that, you start becoming more patient. You're more tolerant of other people. You're not as irritable with other people. You spend more time communicating with others, etc. It all originates in the inner person. Um, let me skip over a little bit here. And the change is complete, Paul says in verse 24, by putting on the new self. Put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created, it's already done, in righteousness and holiness of truth. So that's now, that's how I begin to live. I'm living like I am a new creation in Christ putting on the new man. And I believe the new man, if you study Paul's theology, the new man is Christ. You're putting on Christ. If you study Colossians, it's all about the, the preeminence of Christ. So you're putting on Christ is what we're doing. And that's absolutely mind-boggling to me and thrilling to my soul that I get to become like my Savior and that that's the agenda that my Heavenly Father has for me. Isn't that amazing? That our God is changing us to be like His Son. We're putting on the new man. The new man is Christ. And uh, read Colossians if you want to get a, just a good dose of that. Now, I, I have four bullet points in your notes related to this. You have to follow the whole process. Each step is crucial. Uh, it needs to be put off, be renewed, put on. You got to get rid of the old clothes. It's like a clothes analogy. Uh, new clothes don't fit well over old clothes. Get rid of the old clothes. 
New armor doesn't fit well over the old clothes. He, in chapter 6, tells us to put on the armor of God. Uh, get rid of the old clothes, the old lifestyle, and then be renewed. You can't skip be renewed, and you just practice put off and put on. If you, if you just do put off and put on, and you skip the be renewed, it's very easy for there to be external change without internal change. It just becomes behaviorism. Or put on, you have to practice that. You can't stop with the other two. You need to do the put on, or else you're not truly changed. Um, make sure, and maybe you're sitting here today, or you know a counselee, and you go, wow, it just doesn't seem like this change is happening. They just seem stuck. Well, ask yourself if the whole process is happening. Is there one of these steps that are being skipped, the put off, be renewed, put on, in this whole process of growing and changing? Paul then gives a bunch of illustrations of how this put off, be renewed, and put on process happens in the area of communication. So let's go through these four communication principles. And just to get us prepared to finish that way today, here's some questions just to get your mind going about your communication. What, did, what does it seem like you're serving? What are the roots that produce the bad fruit in your life? What gets the devotion in your life? Remember the Lord's about the heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. What are you willing to sacrifice for? These are all heart type of questions. What stirs your emotions? Now let's finish talking about these four communication principles, and with that as a backdrop, these four will make a whole lot of sense. Of when is a gossiper no longer a gossiper? It's not just I keep my mouth shut. It's about the whole inner person changing and the motivations change. Communication can be quite complicated, right? (laughs) Now think about it. Let's think about these two statements. Here's what's going on in communication. When I'm communicating with you, I'm thinking about what I'm saying, so my me. I'm thinking about you, and what are you thinking about me? And then there's the actual words that I say. In communication, there's your you and what you're thinking about yourself right now, and what you're thinking about me, and then there's the actual words. Uh, Communication can can be quite complicated, and we all have experienced this in marriage. So I read this many years ago, and I thought it was funny. I know you think you understood what you thought I was saying, but what you heard is actually not what I meant. (laughs) (laughs) Now, four communication principles. Here they are, verse 25. Because we're believers in Christ, we learn honest communication. We speak truth. And I'm going to go back and elaborate on these four in a little more detail. Verse 25 says, therefore, here's his first illustration of the put off, be renewed, put on. You can go through every one of these passages, every one of his illustrations and find his put off, his be renewed, and his put on. Because Paul is illustrating his process of change now. Lay aside falsehood, there's the put off. Learn to speak truth, there's the put on. Now, here's the change of motivation, the be renewed in the spirit of your intentions, the be renewed in the spirit of your mind, for we are members of one another. That's a change of motivation. Why should I speak truth with you? Because we're really all part of the same body. If I don't speak truth to you, it's like the left arm lying to the right arm, because Ephesians teaches that we're all part of the same body, we're connected to the same head, where Christ is the mind, he is the head of his body, the church. So Paul says, be honest. More about that in a moment. Then he says, learn to keep current. Keep current. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. And I'm not going to go through the put-offs, the put-on, and the be renewed to the spirit of your mind with every one of these just for the sake of time. But you go back through the passage and think about it. I started with verse 28, and I gave you the put off, the be renewed, and the put on. There's a put off, there's a change of motivation for the thief in verse 28, and then there's the put on in verse 28. Verse 29, 
The wording we've used for years in biblical counseling is attack the problem, not the person. Learn to speak edifying words instead of words that tear down. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. It's easy to pick out the put off, the put on, and the be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Stop unwholesome words, and it's not just talking about swearing. Anything that tears down rather than builds up. Learn to speak edifying words, the put on. Change of motivation, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that it may give grace to those who hear. That's the motivation because of the gospel. And then in verses 31 and 32, act, don't react. Verses, verse 31 is all about reactions. Verse 32 is about actions. Learn to take action rather than reacting to people. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Last time I gave you my testimony of how the Lord used these verses to change my attitude toward my father. And I told you the put off. And when I first read these verses, I thought, wow, that just seems too simple. It seems too naive. Just stop being bitter. How do I stop being bitter against this man that I actually loathe? Um, but that's not the whole point. The put-offs are replaced by the put-ons because of the right motivation in the heart. The be renewed in the spirit of your mind or my mind was because God in Christ has forgiven you. All three of those happen because of what's going on with the put off, be renewed, put on process. Let me go through these and just make some pointers about each one of these four principles. Be honest. Think about this for a moment. We are Christians. We are people of truth. Our Lord said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, of all people on the planet, we ought to be known as people of truth. Now, that implies all kinds of things. Any type of falsehood. Notice, uh, in your, I have in your notes that this is a command. This is not an option if you say that you're a follower of Christ. We're called to speak truth. But it's truth. The next point in your notes, not exaggeration. How do we exaggerate? You always. You never. Uh, one of the big challenges for a parent, getting your children to speak accurately. What do you mean they always? <laughs> you never do that. Or here's another way, evasion. You walk in the door, you've had a bad day, your spouse can read your face like a book and says, what's wrong? And what do you say? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Is that truth? <laughs> We're people of truth. Wouldn't it be better to say, you're right, something is bothering me. I'm not ready to talk about it, but I don't want to violate Ephesians 4 that says I'm going to let the sun go down on my anger, so I need a little bit of time to talk about or to think about this so I can learn to communicate it in the right way. Uh, that reminds me to uh, let you know about this book, Peacemaking for Families, which talks about how to communicate those types of things in a godly way. And I, uh, the last, last month, we talked about a principle called the pause principle, how to have difficult conversations with others. I found it very helpful. You can read the rest of the notes about truth. Uh, look, I have to point out verse 15. Wonderful verse about speaking truth. But speak the truth in love. Uh, some people that are harsh in their communication and maybe have a control type of tendency in their heart say, well, I've got to speak the truth. And you just got to learn to take it. Uh, that's not what Ephesians 4.15 says. Learn to speak the truth in love. Some of you are on the other end of the spectrum. Some of our counselees are on the other end of the spectrum. And they don't want to ever say anything hard to people. It's all about love. I want to be gracious. I want to be merciful. And they need to learn how to speak truth. Doesn't this just show us the beautiful wisdom of Scripture? Speak the truth in love. Uh, that means things like, 
learning to be careful, and this is in your notes, with, with what you say, how you say it, how much you say, when you say it. And remember Stuart Scott's definition again, holy, purposeful, clear, and timely. Next principle, and I'm going to skip over some examples here. Let me just cut up. Keep current. Learn to keep current. We don't have to talk about what the anger is and is not there. We did a whole session on that the last time. Paul is more addressing, do not neglect dealing with problems. Deal with things quickly. Why should I deal with things quickly? Because if I don't, it gives the devil an opportunity. Such a crucial marriage counseling principle here of don't let the sun go down on your anger because it gives the devil an opportunity. First day, unresolved problem, and we don't talk about it, and it's like he's got his little toe in the door. Next day, he's got his foot in the door. The next day, he's got his ankle in the door. The next day, he's got his foot in the door, and pretty soon, there's bitterness and resentment going on in the marriage, learning to deal with each day's problems as they come up. Point C would be worth your reviewing at some point. It says, questions to ask yourself before bringing up an issue to another. And there's a lot of verses there from Proverbs, things to reflect on yourself before you go talk to your spouse about whatever the issue is. Let's go to the third one. Attack the problem, not the person. Learn to put off, as verse 29 says, this, this verse, having people memorize this, has been one of the most strategic verses in marriage counseling for me. Incredible verse about being careful of what we're communicating. Learning to speak edifying things. Now let me make a clarification here. This does not mean you can't ever say hard things to people. The better question is this. Is what I'm about to say, notice under the put on there, going to lead the person down the path of growth? Will this lead the person down the path of edification? When Paul says, stop speaking unwholesome words and only such a word that is good for edification, he's not saying you can't ever say hard things to others. We have to learn how to speak things that help people grow. Sometimes that's hard communication. Learn to attack the problem, not the person. What's the motivation? Because I want to minister grace to people. And then the last one, act, don't react. He says, put off reactions like anger and wrath and slander. I have to learn self-control in those areas. I tell men that have a problem with their tongues, Bite your tongue until it bleeds. Bite your tongue until it bleeds. I have to practice self-control, learn to put on kindness, tenderheartedness, not hypocritically, but from the right motivation because God in Christ has forgiven me. So because of, from that motivation, I then speak kind words, tenderhearted words, forgiving words, rather than words that are reactions. Let's pray just for a moment, and right before I pray, let me look at the last sheet of your outline, and you have some questions there. Based upon what you heard in this presentation, I'm just looking at your outline, yes, based upon what you heard in this presentation this weekend, what are five things from this communication outline you could work on? What are the top two things? How will you work on these? When will you start? I'm just trying to be a good biblical counselor uh, here, give you some ideas of how to apply it. And often what I like to do is have people write out a prayer commitment to the Lord based upon what they heard. Maybe uh, for your quiet time tonight or tomorrow morning, you could just review this outline and answer these questions for yourself and just say, Lord, okay, how does my communication need to change based upon what Paul taught about the put off be renewed, put on process in Ephesians 4.